Kiora Tenakoto no Mai Hairamai. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Join me as we take a walk into the realms of the unexplained, of the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts. I'm Marianne. Thanks so much for joining me today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you live in this beautiful world of ours. Sit back and relax. Let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and see what awaits us there. Halloween, the one night when the veil between the living and the beyond is said to be paper thin. A night for ghost stories, for thrills and for those eerie, spine-chilly moments we crave. And that's exactly what's in store here. Haunting real-life ghost stories. Not only ghosts, vampires and strange creatures. Straight from TikTok users who experience the unexplained firsthand. Huge thanks to them for sharing these supernatural encounters. Be warned, there may be bumps and whispers in the background. It seems I have some other pool guess. Hey guys, keep it down back there! <laughs> Each story you hear is told by the person who lived it. Some tales come with language that's as raw and real as the experiences they describe. Also, a couple of these experiences have some very disturbing elements that may be triggering to some. Consider yourself warned and continue at your own risk. So, pour yourself a favourite spooky season drink, double check those locks and keep the lights on just in case. Trust me, you definitely won't want to hear this in the dark. Are you ready to join me on the Halloween journey into the Shadowlands? Hold tight. This is going to be a haunting, buying tingly ride. Let's begin. On this night of nights, this all hallows, prepare to be scared, frightened, and disturbed. <laughs> The Blue Lady from Amber Alicia 93. All right, so I came straight to the car to tell you this one because I'm on my lunch break and we got 15 minutes. So biggest red flag, biggest red flag. If the house or the apartment is cheap, almost too good to be true, it is. It's more than likely nine times out of 10 haunted. Now, let me tell you my story. Let's just get to it. This is a very intense story. I was about 16 years old. I was working, going to school, and I had two kids. I did apply for my first apartment because I'm like, if I'm going to be responsible, I'm going to go all the way. So I applied at these apartments that I saw that were kind of within budget, you know. Let me tell you how literally a day later, the manager calls me and was like, bring me $100 for a deposit and you're in. You can move in today. Didn't even ask me for the first month's rent. And I didn't think anything of it. I was 70 years old trying to get out of my mama's house. So I was like, yes, I'm on, I'm on my way. No furniture, no nothing. And I went, gave the lady $100. She handed me over my keys. Didn't even ask me for the first month's rent again. Let me emphasize on that. And I was like, okay. Started moving my stuff in. Wasn't a lot because I was just being my first apartment. I really didn't have any help. So, you know, first few weeks, first few days were okay. I invited my friend over. She started dating with me because she was dating my brother at the time. So me and her were very close. And him and her would always come over just to spend time with each other. Well, one morning she comes to my room. I guess she got up early to cook breakfast and she came to my room and she looked like she had just seen a ghost. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, you have something in your apartment. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, something is in here. You have a ghost or something. I'm like, you're tripping. Yeah, okay. I'm like, what happened? And she's like, I was cooking eggs. And when I tried to grab the salt, it literally moved out of my hand. And I'm like, girl, you're tripping. There's probably like oil or something. 
Like, there's no way that could happen. Anyways, I brushed it under the rug. And, uh, like, little small little things would happen. Like, one day we were all watching a movie in the living room. And something hits the back of the wall. Because, okay, so this is the living room wall. And there's a couch in front of it. I had a big old picture frame that was cut in three. So it made one big picture frame. Now, when it hit the wall, the only two side ones started swaying, like, back and forth. The middle one didn't move at all. So it was just, like, I looked back and I'm like, okay, that was weird. Mind you, we're all in the living room. Nobody's in the kids' room. So I'm just like, maybe something fell. I don't know. <laughs> Again, my mind was just trying to find logic as to why these little things were happening. So then I started dating somebody. And he would, you know, stay the night every so often. And I remember this one night we were arguing. He stayed the night. And we had our backs face to each other. So my back was faced towards him. His was faced towards mine. So I'm facing the wall. Mind you, the wall that I'm facing has a big, like, long window. Like, the window goes all the way to the floor. So I turn, and as soon as I turn, I see the silhouette of somebody standing there. And I'm just like, I am terrified because I don't want to move. But I don't want to make too much noise because there is literally a man standing there. So I turn around, and I'm like, there's somebody right there. So my boyfriend at the time turns around, and he's like, oh, shit. He's like, oh, turn on the light. And I'm like, boy, first red flag. Yeah, so he asked me to go turn around. I'm like, looking at him like, are you stupid? Okay, I'm going to go turn around. But when I said that, he got up and finally went to go turn on the, the light. Mind you, we had only been there like maybe two months. Curtains brand new. And when he turned on the light, my curtains were moved like if somebody was standing there. They, they're brand new curtains. So I'm just, you know, that was weird. Every night before I would go to bed, I would close my closet door. So in front of my bed, there was a closet, like a little, small little walk-in closet. Every night, no, I'm sorry. Every, every night I would close my closet door. Every time in the morning, it would be open. And I was just like, maybe the latch is loose again. I would always try to make logical explanations for why little things would happen. Never thought anything of it. Till one day, my daughter, she was about two or three years old at the time. She woke up in the middle of the night screaming, panicking. And mind you, it's just me and my two little ones living there at the time. So I wake up and in their room, they have one window and it's long too. And it wasn't the greatest of neighborhood. So I freaked out and I thought somebody was hurting her. I run to the room and she's in the corner in the dark crying. And she's like, mama. And I'm like, what? She's like, tell the blue lady to get out. She bit me. And I'm like, what? I turn on the lights. Nobody's there. So I'm like, in my head, I'm like, she had a nightmare. She, she bit my finger. I'm looking at her finger. Her finger is red. If somebody bit her or something bit her. So I'm like, maybe it was just a bad dream. Like, again, I put it off. And I had the two kids at the time. My daughter, the one that saw the blue lady or had a dream about the blue lady. And my son, he was a year younger than her. He couldn't talk yet. But every time I would find him, he would be in the closet with the door closed and baby talking. Mind you, he wouldn't talk to nobody. He was a very, very silent kid. I remember one day I was looking for him all over the place, all over the house, because I had the door open because I had made something. I think it burned, and I let all the, the smoke go out of the house, so I left the door open, and my daughter and my son were sitting down on the couch looking at TV. I went to the restroom, and I came out, and my son was not there. So I'm, like, frantically looking for him. Cannot find him anywhere. Run outside. I'm about to call it. Please, like, where is my son at? And then... I'm looking in their rooms, nothing looking in my room. I can't find him anywhere. And I'm like, maybe somebody came in and got him. Like, I don't know. And so I hear baby talk and I follow the voice and I find him in the closet. All the lights are off in my daughter's room and there's no closet light. I open the closet door and he's sitting in, in the closet corner as if, if somebody was cradling him. And he's just there, just baby talking, like happy. And I'm just like, what is going on? Okay, so then it gets worse. So these little like incidents just keep getting worse and worse. My mom comes over one day and I tell her, you know, some weird things have been happening around the house. Emery keeps saying she's seeing a blue lady. They keep talking about this blue lady. My son's doing some weird things and she's like, oh, we'll, we'll settle this, you know? So my mom goes to my daughter's room and she's like baby talking with her because my daughter's two, three at the time. And my mom's telling her like, Where's the blue lady at, baby? So my daughter goes in the room and she looks at her bed. Mind you, it's a little toddler bed. It's literally like an inch, two inches from the floor. And he's like, first right there, grandma. First right there, pointing at her bed. So my mom, she goes and pretends like she's telling the lady, get out of her room. Get out of the room right now. And my mom says, there, baby, she's gone. She's not going to bother you anymore. 
my daughter turns around and she's an old grandma her still there and my mom said oh i'm out and she's like well where show me so my little toddler goes and lifts up her little bed her little toddler bed and she's like hers right there and me and my mom are looking at each other oh my gosh okay anyways so i'm like she had quite an imagination my daughter was a very 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 social kid she talked a lot so i was just like maybe she's using her imagination i don't don't know so let me fast forward it's new year's we go to my boyfriend's parents house and we're there it's 12 maybe one o'clock in the morning and i get this really gut feeling and i'm telling him all night let's go i want to go and he's just one more drink one more drink and we'll go and i'm just like no something don't feel right let's go and so he says okay fine let's go it's already two o'clock in the morning so we head home when we get home my apartment was broken into everything was just flipped over and just it was ransacked and i was just like i knew that gut feeling was for a reason so i call the cops and they come over and the cop is doing the report and he's telling his he's looking at his buddy because it was two of them he's looking at his buddy he's like, remember that story that i told you he's like happened here and i'm sitting there and i'm like what happened here me nosy because i want to know too what happened here and then the cop goes oh shit oh shit and i'm like what happened he's like nah if i tell you you wouldn't be able to sleep at night so i'm sitting there like now you gotta tell me because i'm living here and what what happened so the two cops were talking amongst themselves and i'm over here listening being nosy and he's telling his partner remember that story that i told you it happened here and his partner is like no shit and i'm over here no shit what happened what happened and he's like, I can't tell you because if I tell you, you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. So now I'm like, okay, you just triggered my anxiety. I have crippling anxiety. Now I'm going to be overthinking, like, what happened? And he's like, I can't tell you. And I'm sitting there thinking of ways for to make this man tell me. And I'm like, well, before you go, can I ask you a question? And he's like, I said, does it have anything to do with the lady? And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know. My daughter keeps saying she sees a blue lady. I kid you not. When I said that, his partner smacked him with the report papers. And I was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. When he said that, I was like, oh. Mm-hmm. No. now you gotta tell me so his partner stormed out the house and i'm just looking at him like and he's like look i'm getting the chills and i'm like well i want to get the chills too because i want to know what you're talking about so he's like, okay well i'm gonna tell you but you gotta show me first where your daughter sees this blue lady and i'm like okay so i take him to the kid's room and he's looking around and he's like where does she see her where does she see her and i'm like she always sees her in the corner of her bed and in this closet I open the closet and he looks so confused. And he's like, do you mind taking me to your room? And I'm just like, hey, that's a little bold for you. I'm just kidding. But I'm like, yeah, let's go. So (laughs) I take him. So I'm like, you know, what's going on? He opens my closet and he's like, do you ever see anything in here? And I'm like, no, but weird shit does happen. Like I've seen like ghost people and like shadow people. And every day that I wake up, my closet's open. He's like, it's interesting that you say that. And he's like, it opens by itself. And I'm like, yeah, but these places, these apartments are so ghetto. Like, it's probably like loose. He's like, girl, no. He's like, let me tell you what. I'm going to tell you now. He's like, promise not to freak out. And I'm like, I can't promise anything, sir. So he starts telling me, I haven't been doing this long. I've been a police officer for two years. He's, I've been doing this for two years. And the reason why I won't forget this case is because it was one of my first major cases. And I'm like, okay. He's like, before you moved in here, it happened less than a year ago, actually. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, and me, in my mind, I'm thinking like, dude, I just moved in four months ago. Why would they move somebody in when something just recently happened? That is insane. So I'm sitting there like confused as to why they would even offer me a place when something just happened and didn't even explain anything to me. So he's like, I got a call to show up to a crime scene. So I'm like, okay. He's like, "Um, before you moved in, because my room and my kid's room are back to back. Now, in between our rooms are closets, my closet and their closet. And he's like, before you moved in here, he's like, this wall right here wasn't here. He's like, you actually had one big walk-in closet. Oh, so I'm like, oh, so they juice me too. So they, they give me a haunted place and they juice me with a closet. Like, they make it so small and tiny. And he's like, yeah, they actually cut it in half and put that wall there and made your kid's room. He's like, your kid's room didn't have a closet. So I'm like, oh, okay. So he's like, a lady lived here with her husband and six kids and i'm like okay he's like well one day she found out he was cheating and she confronted him when he came home now he flipped it on her 
And when she confronted him, he told her, I'm leaving and I'm taking the kids. I don't, I no longer want to be with you. So he took the kids and took off. So she stayed home by herself and she went to the closet, which was my closet. No, there was a metal rod in there and she got a belt and hung it up on there and offed herself. He said, when I got to the crime scene, she was kind of sticking it in. Her feet were in the closet. Her body was out. And I'm like, okay, he's like, that's not the crazy part. The crazy part is she was a woman of color. But when he got to the crime scene, she was completely blue. She was, she was blue. So when I'm sitting there telling him that my daughter sees a blue lady, that's why he freaked out because he's like, that's the color that she was. So my daughter was actually seeing something for real. So now I'm getting the chills and I'm getting chills right now just talking about it. That shit traumatized. That's very traumatizing for me. And it haunted my kids for about, I would say, like a year after that. Dogman from another millennial. So we would stay at my great grandmother's house. That was huge property, by the way, like huge. And it was a family reunion. We were the first ones to get there that night. And in the room that we stayed in was a huge, huge room. It was able to fit three beds, three queen beds and a wardrobe in the corner and like our suitcases. It was a really big room. In that big room is a door that has, if you've been to Mexico, you know what I'm talking about. It's like the windows that are blurry that are usually found in like shower doors. So like you could see like figures on the other side. It's just that it's not clear. So this door had that window and that door lets you like another smaller room. So I slept on a bed with my younger sister. Keep in mind, I'm three. So my sister has to be like one and a half, maybe two, which is the furthest one away from the door. It's like the very corner. Next to us is another queen bed and that's my parents. And then across from us is another bed on the corner by that door. And it's my older sister. She's sleeping by herself on that bed. Now, this is where it gets a little crazy. So stick. I woke up in the middle of the night to tapping sounds. I remember sitting up in my bed and looking around the room. What is that? And everybody was sleeping. My dad's snoring. Everybody's knocked out. All the lights are off. The only light that is in the room is the moonlight. There is a window in that big room. And it's like, I remember being so high um, and the moonlight is casting in. Now, on the other side of that, that little small room is, an, is also a window on the same side of the wall. And you can see the moonlight also casting in that other side of the room because it's bright. In there. So I remember looking into that door, that at least a little small room, right? I saw this hairy dog-shaped man. Now, remember, it wasn't clear. I only saw the outline of his face. And I remember his face looked like a Yorkie. It was a big snout and, like, I could see the hair. But one thing I will never forget is its long fingers and nails. I swear to God, it was like a horror movie. Like, he was making the tapping sounds. And I could see how long his fucking nails are. And I remember him pointing at me. So he'd do this and then point at me and then go. He, he would do this for me to come and open the door for him. Now, that sounds bizarre. But I remember him, I could see him visibly getting upset because I wasn't going to open the door. And I remember shaking my head and being like, no, I'm not going. I felt so scared, like something, I don't know what it was. It just something was something, don't go open that. And I see him start getting frustrated and walking back and forth. So he would walk that way, past the window, walk that way, past the window. So start pacing around and then he'd stop at the, at the door again at that little window and start tapping again and would just continue to point and have point down so for me to open the door. I remember that my parents said that I woke them up, that I kept saying that there was a dog man. There's a dog man outside the window. My dad thought it was a man trying to lure me outside. And so he hopped on the roof that is right by that window where my sister's at. And no one could see, no one seen anything. So my mom had to calm me down. She said that she went back to bed. She put me back to bed. But I remember the lights going on and he, he wasn't there anymore. As soon as the lights go off, everybody falls back to sleep. He starts tapping again and he's there again. 
I remember I was so petrified that I slept with the covers over my head and I woke up the next morning. And apparently, I wasn't the only family member who has seen this dog man on the property. Two other people that I know in my family, like distant relatives, have also seen what this creature was and they actually seen it like its face to this day i don't know what the fuck it was i don't know if it's so I, it just felt whatever it was it felt ancient i don't know what it was but if i close my eyes i can put myself back there and i remember vividly what he was doing how he was pacing how he looked those nails the fingers the, it, it was something like fucking pennywise would do i have not stayed in that property in 20 plus years but yeah, if anybody knows what, what it was, what it possibly may be, let me know. Nanny's Palms from Violent Waves, AJJ. I want to try to tell a quick story of something weird that has happened within the past three days in my house. My grandmother, also known as Nanny, my nanny, she was my mom's mom. She passed away on July 4th. And some really strange things have happened since we brought her ashes home. She was diagnosed with cancer in August of 2023, and when she got diagnosed, we kind of joked back and forth, hey, if one of us dies before the other, make sure we show signs that, like, you're still with us, because we always watched Long Island Medium with Teresa Caputo and Tyler the Medium, so we believed in the afterlife paranormal and ghosts and stuff, and we've all, everyone in this house has had experiences with those kinds of things. But my nanny has been sick for a while, and for the past, like, two weeks, our house has been really busy because everyone has been here. My All of my family, we've had like 16 people sleeping in this house for the past two weeks. So I wasn't really seeing any signs that like she was here in the house with us until people started going home. And it was just the core people that lived here, left in the house. And we went and got her ashes the other day. And that's really when things started happening. The first big thing is she wrote poems all the time. Every significant event, she wrote a poem. So for her birthday in November, I wrote her a poem. I printed it out on really nice, that thick decorated paper, handed it to her, read it to her, handed it to her, and she put it in her safe. I didn't email it to anybody. I didn't send it to anybody. And I only printed that one copy. And I wrote it on my laptop. And I haven't even gone on my laptop in the past two months. And my mom came out of the office the other day. And was like, oh, I think this is one of like any poems. And I grabbed it from her. And it was just on like regular printer paper. And I was like, no, this is the poem that I wrote her for her birthday. My mom was like, this was just like sitting on top of the printer in the office. So I'm like, that's so fucking weird. I don't know how it would have got printed off because I didn't send it to anyone. I haven't been on my laptop. And it's not my nanny's copy because my nanny's copy was on that nice thick paper. And then... The other day I was showering and I set my phone on my bed, went in the bathroom to brush my teeth, shower and do my thing and went back in my bedroom and a song was playing on my phone and it was Storms Never Last by Waylon Jennings. And that was the song that she and I used to sing all the time together. We would just randomly break out in the song and whoever started singing it first, the other one would join them. Like for no reason, we would just do it randomly. And it's also the song that I had printed on her memorial card so when i walked to my room and that song was playing on my phone i was like what the fuck so i picked up my phone because i thought okay maybe i started playing a playlist before i went into the bathroom and my phone wasn't on a playlist it was almost as if someone had gone on the apple music app on my phone looked up that song specifically and just hit play on that song it was weird anyways the third thing is my bumpa, my nanny's husband, he lives with us and he has a watch. It's not a smart watch. It's just a regular watch that you have to set, but it has the day, the date, and of course the time. And it, he dropped it the other day and it got broken. And it's one of those ones where you have to like, if it's not on the right day, you have to sit there and wind it for like hours until you get it back to the right date, day. It's kind of complicated. So my sister tried playing with it for a bit, and my mom was like, no, just put it down. We're going to go to the jewelers. They have a special machine that winds it, and we can get it back set to the right day and date. We woke up the next morning, and it was sitting on the counter, and it was fixed. The watch was just fixed. So my mom 
went to my dad and was like, hey, Pete, did you fix Bumbo's, my father's watch? And my dad was like, no, I didn't touch it. I thought you guys were going to go to the jewelers today. So we asked everybody in the house. They touched it. If they fixed it. Nope. It just magically fixed itself overnight. So I'm like, okay, my nanny is definitely showing signs that she's here in the house with us. I That's what I would like to believe. I swear to God, that has to be my grandmother. That has to be nanny. And I just find it so cool and comforting. And I hope these things continue to happen. The Jim Damon from Postmodern Dragon Slayers. I've been waiting about 20 years to get this off my chest. I was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, in the army back in the early 2002 to 05. We deployed in 03. Uh, my unit got back in 2004 ish and our company was assigned to a bunch of details, like other that what's up that, but that was like funeral detail, gate guard, like all this other stuff. And since I only had a couple months left on my contract, my platoon sergeant sent me over to the gym, long gym. I was a fairly modern building, not old. Some of the buildings on Fort Riley really are pretty antiquated. It's an old post, right? And so, yeah, no big deal. So I go over there. And one of the things that I noticed right away is when I was up on the second floor by myself, I always felt like I was being watched. It was just really weird, eerie feeling. The gym is two floors. It has a big glass front from what I remember. You go up the stairs immediately, you're on the second floor. It's got a bunch of gym equipment, like not free weights, but like the machines. And to your left was a balcony that looked out over a basketball court on the first floor. So just for layout. And you go right in, there's a hallway, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, yeah, I was got this creepy feeling about being up there by myself. So Months go by, like it's now late fall. And if you know anything about Kansas or the Midwest at all, is that in places like that, the wind never stops blowing. And, it's, and in this particular night, it was cold and it was rainy. And earlier in the day, we were told that the brigade was having a mandatory fun day. It's as lame as this is, where you're voluntold to hang out with them and have big fun. So the whole brigade, was supposed to play soccer and volleyball outside. Well, because it was the weather was so shitty that they would be bringing in the gym. So we had to clean. And there's one thing in the military will teach you is how to clean stuff. Anyway, so that night it's just blustery and cold and gross, and nobody's coming into the gym because nobody's leaving leaving the barracks. Nobody's coming. Everybody's warm. Everybody is working. And so we cleaned our butts off. Like we scrubbed place down from stem to stern or so I thought but anyway me and this guy named Doherty I'm six foot three this guy's like six foot four and corn fed big big boy right so we go up to the second floor to walk through and uh, he gets out ahead of me and so just being kind of silly but also kind of testing a theory I shut the lights off on him as he got like halfway through the second floor I've never seen a dude that big move that fast and that gracefully by the way back to me toward the light and he was like dude dude don't don't turn this light off i said why not and he was like because i always feel like i'm being watched and i was like okay so the night goes on and it's about 20 minutes to close it's almost 20 minutes to nine or eight something and it's nasty dark nobody's coming so i go ahead and send my crew home we all have to be there at 7 a.m for this mandatory fun day. So I sent them off and locked the door behind me. Well, I'm walking through the gym one last time, making sure everything's the way it's supposed to be. And I'll kiss your bare ass. If we didn't miss the biggest room in the house, the basketball court, there's dust all over this floor. I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. We had managed to pull the bleachers out, but we missed the biggest floor. Anyway, no big deal. I have nowhere to go. It's a Thursday night. I remember it's a Thursday night. Any shit going on. So I grab my broom and I'm sweet. And I'm as Joss Wheat referred to in Buffy is having happy night. So you know what? You're not thinking of anything, nothing positive, nothing negative. You are not having thoughts. And I'm just sweeping along, sweeping along. Well, at one point 
it felt like somebody was standing directly behind me, like directly right at my back. And I thought that James had something got him. And that fucker was messing with me. And with broom in my hand, I spun around and nobody was there. Not fun, you know, but whatever. And I'm off doing my thing again. And like all of a sudden, I had these really, really bad thoughts, really intrusive, really had thoughts like if something were to happen to you, I don't care. If you're going to disappear, nobody ever can look for you. Nobody loves you. Blah, blah, blah. It was an awful string of really, really bad thoughts. And being a preacher's kid, now I'm nervous. You know, it's not cool what I'm feeling. Like, it's that's not me, right? And so when I get nervous, I begin to sing Amazing Grace to myself, you know, because I'm by myself. And I'm, it's now a little spooky. And the amount of malevolence and the amount of anger and just rage, unlike anything I'd ever experienced before in my life, was suddenly directed at me. I was singing the wrong song. It would be like it would be like Biden showing up to a Trump rally. It was bad. It was real bad. It hit me like a wave. And I closed my eyes for just a second. And in my third eye, mind's eye, the bleachers were full of people. And the balcony was full of people. And the glass wall on that second floor looking over was full of people. And they were people. Oh. And I began to quote the 23rd Psalm. Though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I should fear no evil for thou art with me. And my mind switched over to when Jesus asked the mad Gadara, who are you? And the demons answered back, Legion, for we are. And I said, okay, you got the gym for the night. And I forcibly walked to the door back into the hallway because it wanted me afraid. I think it wanted me to hurt myself. And I was alone and both. I put my stuff away, grabbed my car keys, and I drove back to the barracks. I got in my barracks ring, I got under the covers and called my dad. Nothing like that has ever happened since. Nothing like that ever happened before. But I really, honest to God, believe I met a demon or demons. I, I think those words are the same. I think they're the same thing. That's the feeling they gave me. But yeah, that's my ghost story. And I don't want to have enough. So thanks. <laughs> What happened from being Nicole 10280? So when I was about 17 to 18 years old, I remember I went over a friend's house. Now, just some details about this friend. It was her mom, her dad. She's the only child. And then her grandmother lives with her. So we're just hanging out. I think we had went out and actually got something to eat and came back to the house. At this point, I was driving. I had a 2008 silver gold-ish Ford Fusion. So we actually had a science class together, and we were studying for the science test that we had to take on that Friday. I believe this was like Wednesday night. At this time, I had a curfew. I think my curfew was like 10 to 11 on a weeknight or whatever, and then it was like 12 on the weekend. So I had to be home by 10 or 11. So I remember we're like sitting there studying. We got the books open on the floor. We got our index cards, our highlighters, our pens. So we're talking and she looks over on her TV stand and she's like, what is that? So it's like a TV stand with two doors in the middle. She opens the doors and she goes in and she pulls out this VCR tape. She's like, I wonder what this is. I don't know what it is. Do you want to put it in the VCR player? I'm like, yeah, sure. I haven't watched a VCR movie since I was a little girl. So let's go for it. She puts the VCR tape in and we realize that it's a Bratz movie, like a 2008, 2006 Bratz movie. I don't know what Bratz movie it was, but it was like a sleepover. And then it was like kind of scary-ish, like a Halloween sleepover type of Bratz movie. I don't know. I'm going to try to find it if I can so I can tell y'all what it's called. But I remember watching that same Bratz movie when I was a little girl. I loved that movie. I loved all things Bratz. I literally had every Bratz doll and the Bratz doll hit. So I just thought it was funny that she had the exact same movie that I had that I hadn't seen in years. And this is what, 2018, 2019? So we're sitting, we're watching it, we're laughing. We're like, yeah, this was so corny. I don't even know why we like this. We're studying, whatever. So something happened and we decided to go to Walmart. Like I said, I was driving. I drove us back and forth 
So we go in the store, we get whatever we needed. I think we got some more index cards and stuff like that to help us study. And we're out in the parking lot and we're trying to find my car. I'm hitting the button and I'm hearing the car, but I'm not seeing the car. So we're so confused because I never lose track of where I park it. I, I always remember where I park it and I make it a point to look up and see what row we're parked in letter or number wise. We didn't see the car. So we go around and come up row J of Walmart. There's my car. My car is sitting there. We had already been through row J and I was hitting the button the whole time and I did not see my car. Get in the car. I'm like, okay, that's weird. Drive back to her house. Get to her house and I'm like, hey, you know what? It's kind of late. I'm just going to leave and we can study again tomorrow or whatever. We got one more day until Friday. So I get my stuff. I put it in the car and I leave. At this point, it's kind of late. It's probably like eight, nine o'clock maybe. I know how to get to her house and to get to my house is a simple, you know, straight road and a couple turns. I get down to the end of her road and I make a right. I go down to the end of that road, stop at the stop sign, and I'm like, I was literally just here. I make another right. I'm driving, I'm driving, and from that right I took, it should have taken me about five minutes to get to the end of the road. Like I said, when I left her house, it was about nine o'clock. By the time I got out of the road and I got back home, it was 12 o'clock, y'all. My dad is fuming. He's like, Brittany, you were supposed to be home an hour ago. We've been calling you, texting you, nothing. You haven't been answering. Where have you been? I told my dad, I was like, I left early. I left beyond early at nine o'clock, matter of fact, to get here on time. I don't know what happened between us watching that Bratz movie, us going to Walmart, me trying to leave. And seeming like I ended up on the same road twice, taking the same turn twice. And the extra time it took me to get from the back road to the highway is still so confusing to me. So I'm texting her and I'm like, hey, what time did I leave your house? She said, you definitely left about 8.45 to 9 o'clock. So why did I get home at 12? What the hell was in that Bratz movie? My mother's protector from Spook. I wanted to tell this ghost story for years. I just never got around to it. This is actually my mother's story, but she's too afraid to talk about it 20 years later. So I had to learn about this through my dad. I am from the Big Island of Hawaii, okay? And this story takes place right here on a road from Lapakahi State Park all the way up north to where I'm from called North Kohala, Hawaii. And for further context, Lapakahi State Park is a ancient Hawaiian fishing village that was preserved by the state of Hawaii and made into a national park. If you ask anyone from North Kohala all the way down to Kauai High, Everyone has a ghost story about Lapakahi, and this is my mom's. When I was a kid, my mother used to work three jobs, and one of them was in Waikoloa Village, which is where all the tourist resorts are. My mom had been awake for 36 hours straight and was extremely tired and finally had a day off from work, so she started driving home. Of course, after working almost 36 hours straight at three different jobs, she was extremely tired and falling asleep behind the wheel. We were swerving in and out of lanes, falling asleep behind the wheel, being woken up by going off of the road into the dirt. But again, she worked three jobs just to support me being the one-year-old baby. So she wanted to get home to me because she hasn't seen me in three days. She continued swerving in and out of traffic, falling asleep behind the wheel until she passed Lapakahi State Park. Now this happens sometime between two and three o'clock in the morning. So it's extremely dark outside. So when she fell asleep once again behind the wheel, she woke up immediately because she felt something else in the car with her. Out of her peripherals, she noticed a massive Hawaiian man sitting in her car in the passenger seat with his arms crossed and looking straight forward. She was so terrified. She did not look over at him at all, but she did note that he was extremely massive. Ancient Hawaiians sometimes got between six, eight and seven foot tall about 300 pounds of nothing but muscle. A drive from Lapakahi State Park all the way to where I'm from, exactly my house, takes about 20 minutes. So for 20 minutes, she sat in the car with the ancient Hawaiian man doing nothing but staring straight forward. After a couple minutes, she realized that this man was not there for any sinister purposes. He was there to try and protect her from herself. So as she became more comfortable, she became more sleepy. And she said every time she would start to shut her eyes and drift off to one side of the road, that entire side of the road would light up like a road flare. He sat in the car until they parked the car. And when my mom turned to thank him, he was gone. 
He immediately ran into the house crying and screaming, went to the phone and immediately called her boyfriend, now my stepdad and her husband, to explain what had happened. Explain to her that his last name, Kahalio Umi, means the protectors of Umi. And Umi was the high chief somewhere around the coast that she was driving at. And more than likely, that was Umi, our chief ancestor, who was there watching over my mother that night. If you're ever wondering why us Hawaiians have such respect for our ancestors, that's why. My vampire story from Christy Robinet. Never ever thought I would tell this story, at least in a public forum. But here it goes. This is my vampire story. It still baffles my mind when I think that, say that, and I still get the creeps with the memory of any of this. And I'm going to be a little bit cryptic if you get my drift with regards to some of the experiences. But several, several, several decades ago, I had lost my job. I had just had my baby girl. She's going to be 30 this year. So that's how long it's been. And I had gotten a job interview at a local business. Again, I'm not going to say what kind of business. And I went to this interview and I immediately felt something odd with the owner of this business. There was something so mesmerizing about him. He wasn't good looking, but he was good looking. It's hard to explain. There was just something strange about him and he just felt almost hypnotic. And he said, I'm interviewing for a couple more people and I'll give you a call in a couple days and let you know if you get the job. Okay. I did get the job. A couple days later, he gave me a phone call and he said, I am offering you this job at this pay. And it wasn't bad. The hours weren't bad. The pay wasn't bad. And I said, let me think about it. I had another offer on the table. And he said, please let me know by tomorrow. And I'm like, understood. So I had called my mom and my mom is very intuitive, even though she didn't really want to admit that she was. And I told her and I'm like, I, I got this job offer and I didn't even tell her a lot of the creepiness that this guy kind of gave me. And she's like, Christy, I have a really bad feeling. Do not accept this job. Do not accept the job. I'm telling you right now, something's not right. Do not accept this. job. Now, this is a business that was in the person's family for a long time. And so it wasn't anything out of, you know, it, it wasn't like a starter company. This person was kind of known in the community. My mom didn't know him, but so it was a substantial, you know, real job. And I'm like, mom, I, I don't understand. I need a job. She's like, you're going to get a job offer from that other place that you interviewed for. Just stick it out. Tell this guy no and accept the other job once it comes. And I'm like, I, this job was actually, it was pretty good. But I took my mom's advice and I called the gentleman the next day and I said, I'm so sorry. I am really honored, but I'm declining the job offer. And thank you very much for your time. And he's, I will double your pay. Excuse me, sir. I will double your pay. Now, it already was good pay, but double the pay was a lot of pay. And I'm like, again, something felt really off. And I'm like, sir, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to decline. And he's, I'm going to check with you in a couple days. And there was just something very ominous about the way that he said that. And that night, I ended up having a dream with him. In it. And it was very vampire-ish is the only way that I can describe it. And the business that he was in also spoke volumes for that. So a couple of days later, he called me and I said, again, sir, I've accepted another job and I did not tell him with whom. And he was, he's like, I will triple your salary. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. And he said, I can tell that you are very psychic and I can tell that you know who I am and what I am. And I think it would behoove you to take this job what so I told him again no thank you 
And he said, okay. Now, this was like internet wasn't really a thing. Like you couldn't really look people up. There was AOL chat and such like that, but you couldn't really look people up like you can now. And so I ended up accepting a job at a, a cabinet store and as an office manager. And I didn't hear from him, but I was still having these weird nightmares with him. And and I'm like, it's just got to be in my head, right? But it was almost like he could read my mind. It was very strange. Well, guess who showed up at the kitchen store the second day that I started? Yeah, this guy. And and it's like he knew that I was going to be there. Hi, Christy. And I'm like, excuse me, what are you, are you stalking me? What are you doing here? And he's like, I'm ordering a new kitchen for the business. Like, it was nothing. And he continued to come in my dreams. About a year later, I ended up taking a job at a fireplace store as an office manager. A couple days into that, this gentleman walks in and says, I need a new fireplace for my business excuse me. Now, I'm not going to say everything about the business and everything about him, but you might be able to figure it out with a clue. And that is he lived above the business. That's all I'm going to say. So he's like, yep, I need a fireplace. And I'm like, sir, I don't understand why you're here. And he continued every time he's like, would you like to work with me? I'm like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I worked at the fireplace store for a couple of years and he would every once in a while call and he would ask for the fireplace to be serviced. And I ended up telling my boss at the time, like how I felt about him. And he would laugh and he's, I'm going to send you out there with the tech. And I'm like, no, you're not. But he was like, yeah, something's strange about this person. Something is almost like immortal. Even if you look at the family lineage, it's like he's existed before and it wasn't like his great, great grandfather. It was like him. So I ended up quitting a couple of years after that and I worked for a school district. And guess who showed up? The admin office. Him. And in the meantime, he's still coming in my dreams. And every once in a while, he's still calling me and asking me if I want a job. And my mom had passed away. I'd gotten divorced. I mean, we are eons into this. And I ended up running into him at a store. And he, you know, do you remember everybody you interviewed like one time? Because he either has a really crazy memory or it wasn't like a stalker. He just, he just wasn't. That wasn't the case. It, it's just, again, it was very vampirous. Does that work? And so he, I ran into him and he's like, hi, Christy. And again, he's like, how are you doing? And it was just very kind of Norman Bates creepy. I ended up in, in the job that I'm in now. I'm a professional psychic medium. I ended up having to go to a competitor of his to work on a case. And we ended up talking about this gentleman and his business. And I didn't say anything, but the owner of this establishment went, just Christy, make sure you stay away from, because he's a vampire. And I didn't laugh. And she didn't laugh. And she knew I knew. And I knew she knew too. So vampires do exist and they don't necessarily wear capes. Sometimes they wear business suits and sometimes they invade your dreams. And I feel as if there's a possibility that my life at that time was a little bit crazy. And it was because of the psychic sort of like vampire energy that he was sending to me because he was mad that I did not accept a job with him. I would love to tell you more, but I don't want to open up that can of bats. And yeah, you can think I'm crazy. And yeah, I can't necessarily validate that he was a vampire, except several people in his industry have validated it for me. So, but yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And it's a true one. Do you really want to know from Escalation Bunny? 
if you're laying in bed and you actually want to sleep tonight, then you should skip this. For the rest of us who like scaring the shit out of ourselves, welcome. When I was a kid, my best friend asked a Ouija board how old she was going to be when she died. Okay, spoiler, it told her 22. Probably wondering, did she die at 22? I'm going to tell you a story that only three people know. Well, two, because one of them is dead. The story starts about 20 years ago when Christina and I were about 12. We were inseparable and we used to hang out with her older sister all the time. We were at their house a lot. It looked like a normal suburban house on the outside, but I swear you walked in and it was like a portal to the underworld. This house scared the absolute shit out of me. I would hear screams coming from the attic and I would look down this long, dark, creepy hallway, see dark figures like motioning up when I'm trying to sleep at night. To make matters worse, we would sit in her room with the lights dim, pull out the Ouija board and play all the time. But here's the thing. It only ever worked for Christina. It was like she had some weird connection to it. Naturally, her sister and I always thought this was fake and she was just doing it for attention because it would move so fast all over the place, telling us everything. Never worked when we did it alone, so we were a little bit suspicious. Whatever ghost was on the other side of this had diarrhea of the mouth. This was not like you see on the horror movies where it's, oh, this is slowly moving to yes or no. No, this was like a T9 texting expert ghost that word vomited constantly. So, so one day we had just finished watching big fish and in that movie there is this creepy old witch and you can ask her how old you're going to be when you die christina loved this idea next thing you know she's pulling out the ouija board and immediately asking how old am i going to be when i die planchette slowly starts to move towards the numbers and it hovers over the two and then it takes a little bit of a movement back and comes right back to the two christina didn't even skip a beat she grabs her red notebook that she wrote down all of the answers the Ouija board said in it, wrote down, age I'm gonna die, 22. Completely calm. Little did we know, something was set in motion and some weird shit started happening for the next 10 years. About a year after the Ouija board incident, Christina's middle school boyfriend tragically died. He was babysitting his three-year-old little sister hanging a rope swing for her in the backyard. The parents got home, found the little girl screaming in the backyard, looking at her brother hanging by the tree. He accidentally got tangled in the rope and hung himself. He had been dead for about three hours. While Christina was upset about this, she wasn't hysterical, more so distant. And she said to me, I think I'm gonna see him again soon. I just don't see myself growing old. I can't be that upset about it because something like that might happen to me. For the sake of being able to sleep at night, I wrote off a lot of these things. Christina and I grew apart over the years. A couple of other creepy things happened here and there, but for the most part, I think she had a pretty normal life. She got a job, got a fiance, seemed pretty happy from what I could tell. So now we're about 21 and Christina's wedding is coming up. I didn't go to the wedding, but I saw this footage later. Christina's standing at the altar, all smiles, having just been married, trying to take photos with her family. Softly in the background, you hear a little girl singing the itsy bitsy spider. Christina yells super loudly, Kenna, it's time to take photos. And the camera just slowly pans left. And then you get a great view of this beautiful little flower girl sitting in a pew, holding a Bible upside down, singing the itsy bitsy spider. She shuts the Bible, takes a couple of steps towards the aisle, and slowly walks forward. I shit you not, this three-year-old looks up at this bride and says, Christina, are you going to die soon? I freaked out when she heard this, which would be a normal response, but I heard her talk about death so many times as a teenager and just how it didn't faze her that it was a little bit odd to hear her talking about it like this. I really think it's because she was five months pregnant. Things had changed for her. About a year after the wedding, Christina was at a cabin with her family in the mountains having some celebration. Everyone was there including her newborn son, it seemed like one of those days where nothing could go wrong. Her family always had a four-wheeler that we would take around the mountain to have a really good time on. At some point in the afternoon, her and a friend decided to take it out for a ride. But that day, something was different. As they rode through the trails, everything seemed all right until Christina screamed. The brakes aren't working. They flew off of a cliff. Both of them were rushed to the hospital. Christina didn't make it. She died on the way there. 22. <laughs> Phantom skipping from Chili Kim Chun 2. Yep, I have a few ghost stories. They spooked me the fuck out, right? So here's, here's the story. I was in 
Puerto Rico, I think I was in my junior year of high school and I was looking for a college. I was looking for a college someone to go to. And my uncle and I, we take this little trip. We're on the island already and we're, you know, traveling to wherever it is that we have to go. And we stop at an Airbnb before Airbnbs were a thing. You know what I mean? This was like years ago. And it's an elderly couple. They've got to be, geez, they've got to be like late 60s, sorry, late, late 70s, early. And maybe not that old, but like super, super up there. And, uh, you know, we come across the sighting and we see like, oh, okay, cool. That I will stay here for a few, for a few days. They had a duplex, but it wasn't a side-by-side -side duplex. It was an up and down duplex. So they say, hey, we're going to go visit family in whatever part of the island they're going to. And they, they say, no, you, you guys can stay here. This is the set rate, blah, 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 blah. And they give us the rules of the house, right? Okay, cool. Me and my uncle, we will be obliged. We pay them half up front. Cool, cool, cool. They leave. Now, at this point in time, I am not old enough to go live the nightlife. And PR. So I'm, I'm, at the, I'm at the place. My uncle goes out. He goes to the bar and says, hey, man, fucking behave. I'm like, cool. I got my Xbox. I got my phone. Talk to my homies. We're playing on whatever games out that Halo, whatever. And uh, eventually, you know, time passes and it's like one, and it's like one or two in the morning. And I hear just this knocking. I was tapping, rather, is what it was. It was just this tapping noise. And this tapping noise, no matter where I went in the house, the noise sounded close to me, but I was, I was never close enough to the noise to know that that's where the noise was. Does that make sense? Like no matter what room I was in, it was the same volume, but it never let me know that I was close to what was going on. It's something in the walls, it's something in the, it's, it's like a heater, it's not gonna, I fucking freak out, right? Cause it's just been, that's just been this. I'm freaked out. I run into the room, I shut the door, I've never yelled louder. Man. Then the door, I call my uncle, hey dude, hey, some shit is fucking going on. I need help. He goes, oh, you're fucking, you're just being a chump be on leave i'll be home not worried about it he comes home it's five in the morning of course the noise stops the noise has stopped now until 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 the next night comes around I'm like hey unk, don't leave don't leave me i'm terrified i'm like that those noises happened all night until my uncle got home repeat night number two my uncle stays okay on 1 30 in the morning two o'clock you hear it what the fuck are you doing? I'm not doing nothing. Come to the room with me. We walk around the house. This goes on. Around the house. All night. All night. This goes on. And we are freaking the fuck out. The third day comes around and we are, we're ready to fucking. We are ready to go. As a matter of fact, we don't even stay in the house. The third day, we get whatever sleep we can. And we're out on the fucking town the entire day. Okay. We call the, the people whose house it is. They come back. And my uncle pays them the rest of the money. They ask how the stay was. And we're like, oh, well, it was, it was relatively good, right? The house didn't burn down. It didn't catch fire. But the fuck is this noise? So the husband, he kind of looks very, he looks distraught when he turns around and goes inside the house. Wait. The wife starts to tear up and she goes, oh, what happened? And my uncle goes, well, we were fucking sleeping. And we heard this tippity tappity, tippity tappity, tippity tappity. Boom, 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 boom. And then somebody like fucking just aggressively just strummed a fucking guitar. Oh, fucking goosebumps. This lady, she was, I, I am so, so sorry. I am so, so sorry. We should have told you about her. Their daughter, okay, this was like 60 years before. I don't know. The daughter was fairly young. She was like 10. She would jump rope. In, okay. So also, let me preface. Everywhere in Puerto Rico is tile floor. And you're very rarely going to find a rug floor. She was jumping rope. She was jumping rope. Wearing socks inside the house on time. She clipped herself and fell down the steps. Then her father used to play in a band. Guess what he played? The guitar. The little girl tripped over the jump rope, stumbled down the steps, and broke her neck on her father's guitar. And that's what we heard all night. I'm so sorry. How Restaurant Ghost from House Catch Chronicles. 15 years ago, I worked in a restaurant that was inside of a house. The house was about 100 years old. It was built originally for the first mayor of that town, small city. I don't know how long families lived in that house, but by the 80s, it had been converted to a restaurant, a somewhat well-known French restaurant, which was led by a well-known French chef. It sat vacant for a while after the restaurant closed, and was purchased by the owners that I ended up working for in early 2008. And by the end of 2008, we opened the restaurant and I worked there pretty much from the day it opened. 
when it had been converted to the first restaurant, about a third of the house had been converted to a restaurant kitchen, but the rest of the house was still very much a house. So you walked in the front door, you entered into a foyer, there was a hostess podium, um, there were benches and chairs for people to sit and wait for their table or to have like a cocktail or an appetizer. You would walk through a giant entryway and then into a very large dining room. I think it had originally been a formal uh, living room. The bar was on the far end of that dining room. It shared a wall with the kitchen. There was a uh, staircase with a landing, and then around the staircase, there was a somewhat smaller dining room. The second floor featured the restrooms and two rooms that previously had been bedrooms, but they were converted to private dining rooms. So I was the bartender. I was there most nights. I closed almost every night. And so I was often there by myself for anywhere from, you know, an hour and a half to two hours. There was a lot of side work, stocking to do, prep, and a lot of glassware to polish. So I would just be in there by myself, occasionally listening to music, but mostly just being quiet and just like zoning out. And there would be nights where I would be in there in the bar, polishing glassware, doing my side work, and I could hear in the other dining room what sounded like standard restaurant noise, like the noise you hear when you walk into a restaurant voices, people chatting, you know, cutlery, hitting plates, ice in glasses, you know, just like regular restaurant noise. And I knew nobody was in there. I knew I was the only person there. And I knew that if there was anyone in there, would it be enough for, there wouldn't be enough people to make that type of noise, right? And so I would go check. And of course, as I got down the hall around the staircase and into the room, the noise would stop. And it wasn't scary but it was just weird. And I would bring it up to uh, the owner and she would say, you know, oh, you're probably just hearing this or you're probably just hearing this. Or at one point she thought I needed to get my hearing checked, you know? And then there were other nights where I would hear what sounded like kitchen noises. And if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you know what I'm talking about. Just the standard, you know, pots hitting the stove, the clicking sound that like a gas stove makes when you're turning it on water running, dishes clanging, you know, utensils, people talking, like the cooks, I could hear like low male voices talking. And again, I knew nobody was in there. And I would be behind the bar most of the time doing that closing side work. And so the bar shared the wall with the kitchen. So it was even clearer, the door, the kitchen door was right there. And I would still go in there and look, of course. And I'm like, I know I'm what I'm hearing, but there's nobody there. And again, it wasn't scary. It was just like, this is weird. So the stairs to go to the second floor in the private dining rooms, you would go about five or up five or six stairs. There was a small landing and then it, the stairs would turn five or six more and you'd be at the top. And as you got closer to the landing up those first stairs, it would, the temperature would start to change it would start to get chilly. And by the time you got up to the second floor, it was outright cold. And it wasn't just the temperature change. There was like a heaviness in the air. The closer you got to the top, to the second floor, the heavier it became. It just, it was a a real uneasy feeling. And it wasn't just me that felt this. It was everyone, other staff, other guests, right? At first, when we first opened in that first month or two, you know, the owners just kept trying to figure out if like heating was broken. I mean, again, it was an old, it was a large old house. So they were like, it's just the heat, you know, it's this and this and this. And eventually there was just no other answers. It was that something was going on. Nobody wanted to go to the bathroom because it was up there. And if I hadn't gone to the bathroom before everybody left, I would be holding it because there was no way I was going to the bathroom in that building by myself. One day I was working a double and I had about three or four hours between my shifts and I was taking college classes at the time. So I thought I would just go up to one of those private dining rooms and study. This was the middle of the day, broad daylight, like two, three in the afternoon. I take all all my stuff up there. I go sit down and I only made it in one of those rooms for 30, 45 minutes. It was so uncomfortable. It was just oppressive. The air was oppressive up there. It was just, I was very uneasy. 
people would like large parties would make reservations. They would dine up there once or twice and then they would ask to be seated in the dining room. And we didn't have room for large parties in the dining room downstairs. And they were like, we don't care. You can break our party up. We just don't really like it up there. Nobody wanted to be up there. So one night I was there by myself and we had recently gotten a television for the bar. So I was standing with my back to the bar and I was looking up at watching the television with the sound kind of low while I was polishing glassware. And I was looking at the television and I just like, at the same time, this like dark blur just dipped by my right eye. And I, I felt like this jolt of electricity just go all down the side of my face and my neck. The hair on my arm just stood up on my right arm. So I turned and looked and I was facing that large entryway that I mentioned that was connected to the foyer and I didn't see anything. But I just knew like something else is here. Wasn't scared, but just kind of, I don't know. I went around the bar. I went out into the foyer because I was just looking for anything. And at this point, I, I, I know like it's not another human being, but something is in this building with me. And I was rounding the stairs. And as I got closer into that other dining room, I started to feel the electricity even more. So you would walk through the door. The door to that other dining room was on the right hand side and around you, you would around the corner into the dining room and there was like a little weird alcove nobody really knew what it was and you could fit like a table and two chairs there like two, like a bistro table and chairs there and as i walked further into that dining room and got closer to that alcove all the hair on my body stood up not necessarily my scalp but like my arms the back of my neck i felt like someone had just zapped me with electricity and it just kept getting stronger. And I just, I, I started to get uneasy. That's when I started to get uneasy. And again, I wasn't fearful. All I, all I could say with certainty was that I knew that something was in that house with me or something, a group of people, I don't know. And they were in that alcove. They were sitting at that bistro table. I shut everything down. I left. I did not finish my side work. I came in the next day. My boss was like, why was all this stuff out? And I told her what happened. And she was just like, yeah, you know, there's been some stories about this house. And I'm like, oh, so now you tell us like all this stuff about me hearing things and saying, and you're trying to make it seem like I'm crazy. Anyway, long story short, that experience changed my entire perspective on what I think, quote unquote, ghosts are. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts as ghosts. I, after that day, I no longer believed in like transparent figures floating around a house. You know what I mean? It's energy. It is just straight up energy. And that is absolutely what I felt that day. The cat thing from Speak Spirited. I grew up in a very, very, very haunted home in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. And that house was over a hundred years old. The whole grounds were haunted. Like the bars were haunted. The house was haunted. Like everything about that place was crazy haunted. I have so many stories, but specifically this one, I still can't explain it. And I'm very curious to see if anyone else has seen something like this. So I remember one night I was just, I just woke up and something was very, very, very off. You would feel it. If something was, you just wake up in the middle of the night and that you would just wake up with dread, like something's in the room, something like right there. He'd wake up and you see something, like the door would open, like it was crazy at night. And it was all upstairs, like most of the activity happened upstairs. I'm in my bed, I wake up and I'm looking at the pile of toys that I have, like on the bottom of my bed. I have all my stuffed animals and stuff. And I'm looking at this pile of toys and I'm seeing the silhouette. It's really dark, but I can see the silhouette. And out of the pile of toys, almost as if it was hiding in there, it was like pretending to be one of them, this thing just comes and rises up and gets bigger and rises up. And it was like, it looked like a skeletal, starving, like bony cat, like a broken cat. And it was twitching, like it was twitching. And it was just rising up out of my toys. And I'm like frozen in fear. And this thing, it gets bigger. And it was like, literally like, I love cats. 
but we had tons of cats so that was like terrifying to see this like deranged looking skeletal it was completely black no face just shape and it was just like twitching so scarily and it was so disgusting and it was like rising up and it starts making its way towards me i can see it like i'm blinking my eyes trying to like wake see it go away it's not going away and i start seeing it come towards me and i'm frozen in my bed and that's when i begin to see the blanket sink down as it's coming up on my leg i could see and feel the weight of it it felt super heavy and there's a little thing but that thing felt super heavy and it starts coming up on top of me i could see the indents in my blanket and i book it downstairs out the top bunk i don't know why i didn't leave that room but my sister my little sister was sleeping underneath me on the bottom bunk and i ran into her bunk and we were like crying and holding each other and we eventually dosed off but that was that experience with that crazy thing and i don't know what that was and so that was like when i was younger and things you know they were very active in that house like it was almost it was very violent it felt really weird because like my parents were kind of abusive and very religious and it felt like the energy liked that like it liked little kids getting hurt like it, it was so horrible like it was like crazy there was like i was shoved several times and i ran away when i was 17 and when i ran away it not only obviously that disrupted my whole family but it, it disrupted the paranormal in the house the energy just got a lot scarier and i felt like i was protecting my siblings and when i left the house they were all free game and i felt like the activity got worse and worse and worse and they started feeling seeing and hearing a lot more my siblings did and specifically this is like back to the story so a lot of the activity happened upstairs specifically the hot spots was the bathroom and the bathroom had the attic and a lot of like older midwest towns like the attic it could be like a plank of wood and like wooden steps like this is how old this house was it was like a plank of wood with wooden steps and you know like the hold down ladder to the attic no nah, it wasn't a hold down it was a plank of wood that you had to like shove up and maneuver down it was crazy old and it was super heavy and no matter how many times you would like close the attic you would like walk into the bathroom and look up and it would be moved it would be the attic would be cracked open this big ass piece of wood be moved over and it would just be completely black just staring at you you were always watched in the bathroom a lot of shit happened in that bathroom doors would open and lights would turn on shadow people would dance across the room like it was crazy and one day my sister this is years later she's going downstairs so she can see in the bathroom and she's going down the stairs and she sees the skeletal cat creature just hovering over the ground just twitching in the middle of the day and it was just twitching and it was just solid black and it looked like that same shape it was like you know like a skeletal cat she calls me up and at that time like this was years later when i saw that thing in my bed I never told her she didn't know what it looked like. We were scared, you know, and I forgot about it. Like, we moved on. I never told her what that thing looked like. So when she described it to me, I got this huge pit. And that's the big thing because I'm like, we saw the same thing. What the hell was that? What is that? Why is it upstairs? It was so weird. It was super weird. And yeah, so we still can explain that. And I'm actually curious to see, like, I hope someone has, like, or I don't hope, I guess, because that thing was, like, terrifying, but... Has anyone else seen that? Because I've always wondered to know what is that? Like, it honestly, it looked like, and my brother thinks he saw it too, but he said his more looked like more like a hell dog demon type thing. Like it looked like embers and flame was like coming off of it. Like some crazy stuff. There's so much that happened in the house. Like the whole, like the barns were haunted. You would see shadows. Like you would just see like a silhouette of something, like a shadow person just like standing in the barn window looking at you. And you would see at night, like if we like looked at night and looked at the property, you would see like shadow people just walking around the property. And my parents never acknowledged it and were just like super anti stage anything and super religious, yet like things were literally being slammed and moved and 
tossed and people like getting bruises and oh my god there's so much but anyway that's the story that i cannot explain i do not know what that creature was or what that was and it's super weird that my sister saw like the same exact thing so there you go Vampa and nola from skanky and scored hunt for 20. everyone's talking about their vampire story so i'm gonna tell mine i don't really talk about it because people think I'm fucking crazy. And I am also someone who grew up... Well, I, I wasn't raised in Louisiana, but I grew up in NOLA. Hardcore. I have Cajun friends, Cajun family. I was a spicy dancer for a really long time and always went down to NOLA to, like, get an extra bag. And as a spicy dancer, I traveled all over the U.S. I danced in Las Vegas, NOLA, NYC... LA, anywhere that had a insane nightlife, like Miami, stuff like that. And I'm also a lover of places with a very rich history and rich nightlife. So NOLA was just home for me, you know? Anyway, so one of these days that we decide to go and travel, I have a girl group that I traveled with, and it was myself, Fox, that's what the girls knew me as, Hennessy, Brooklyn, and Tia. And we buddy system. We never left without at least one other friend. If we went out, it was a group of all of us, you know, like going out to eat or whatever. We never went out by ourselves alone. One night, we're in NOLA. We decided that that was where we wanted to go. And if you know New Orleans, you know that it has a very, very rich history of the occult and strange things happening that can't easily be explained. And I know from my childhood and the things that I've seen that everyone kind of just brushed under the rug and was like, no, you didn't. Vampires, witches, werewolves, mermaids, fairies. There's a reason why our ancestors were talking about them way before the Bible was even made. And I'm a firm believer that while they may not be what we've read, they exist. And what I'm about to tell you only confirmed to me that these things exist. We just don't know about it yet. Or maybe they don't want us to know. Anyways, our plan was to be there for two weeks. And the first, I want to say maybe three days, we had already hit our goal with money. So we decided we were going to take like a two-day we were going to actually enjoy our vacation. We weren't going to work. NOLA has quite a few alternative or goss bars, speakeasy pubs. There's also a lot of hidden speakeasies and pubs in the underground or wherever. I currently live in Oklahoma City. Same thing here. Anyway, so we're at this club and I, for the life of me, really can't remember what this club was. But I do remember that we were being harassed by a particularly fedora-wearing dude. And he grabs our friend Tia by the arm. And, you know, we're immediately like, like, whoa, hold on, big boy. But this guy comes over and he kind of just puts himself in between them and kind of shoes the... And he, but he doesn't, he doesn't say anything to this guy. He just looks at him. And the guy shuts up, doesn't even try to fight him or or rebuttal or nothing he just walks away i didn't necessarily think it was a little weird at the time you know because i was like well obviously that guy could have gotten his ass kicked by our savior over here you know but when i looked our savior or whatever our guy our knight in shining armor for the day it was he was so beautiful it was unsettling do you get do you get what I mean? He didn't look real. He didn't look human. He was so, so pretty. He didn't look human. And humans don't look like that, man. There was something about him when I was looking at him that just hit my uncanny valley. He looks human, but that's not human. You know, the lady on the flight, the, that motherfucker back there is not real. That's how I felt. Now, granted, this was years ago. But, like, when that video went viral, I felt hurt because I went through that shit. And I immediately was looking at my friends. Y'all see this shit, too, right? I'm not the only one. 
his eyes were a, they were a color of green that I had never seen before. I didn't, they were like, it was like hypnotic. Like when you looked in his eyes, it was like a, yeah, keep looking at me. You can, you, it, it was almost like you could hear his voice in your head and it was weird. And I'm autistic, so I don't, I already don't like looking people in the eyes, but that dude made me fucking uncomfortable. Every time I looked in his eyes, I could hear his voice in the back of my head. So I'm all, I, I, I'm over here shaking. I'm, I am tense. I, I do not want to be here. I want to leave. The look that this guy gave me when I was like, I'm ready to leave. I thought it in my head. And then he looked at me and I looked at him and we shared a moment. And in the back of my head, I heard, no, you don't. And I straight up, if you've seen, if you've seen the video of the lady talking about how she gave a vampire a lift drive and she felt like honey, like drifting over her, like a sense of everything's going to be okay, kind of. Like, I'm not, I'm not looking for you kind of thing. That's what I felt too. Just this weird, warm sensation just running down my, from the top of my head down to my feet. Just this weird, warm sensation of stop freaking out. You're going to make this harder on everybody if you don't stop freaking out. So, at this point, I calmed down because I've watched enough true crime docs to know that panicking is not going to get anybody anywhere. I start devising a fucking plan because in my mind, I'm not really thinking this dude's a vampire at this point. I'm really just thinking this motherfucker is going to kill us. Long story short, by the end of the night, he has convinced all four of us to go to this hidden speakeasy. Everyone else is fine with this, this. Oh, yeah, let's go someone. Let's go somewhere for people like us, is what this guy says. And all the girls are fucking down for it. They're ready to fucking go. They grab their purses. I'm like, we are going to get unalive. But we go. We go and Tia goes missing at some point. We don't know where she's at. The guy that brought us here is also gone. And last we saw, he was with her. So already I'm, I'm freaking out. And I take a look around the room and I notice that, because at this, because I hadn't up until this point, because I was so focused on trying to figure out how to get me and my girls out of this situation. I look around the room and I notice half of the people in here are human. The other half don't fucking look human. They don't look human. They look exactly like the motherfucker that brought us here. Now I'm starting to wonder, okay, we're in a fucking coven of cryptids. Pull Brooklyn aside, I'm like, we need to get the fuck out of here. I'm almost positive that we have walked into some supernatural shit that we are not ready to fucking deal with. Our mortal brains cannot comprehend this shit. She goes and finds Tia. She's making out with the guy that brought us here in the corner. And she decides that she's going to spend the night with him. We do our best to try to dissuade her from this. He convinces us rather easily, might I add. He means no harm to her. He just wants to have a little fun. We're shitty friends because we let her do it. Because we, we felt convinced that he wasn't going to do anything to her. I didn't. Everyone else did. But she comes home. The next day, she comes back to our apartment, our hotel room, whatever. The ne- Literally, the next day, he gets her an Uber, brings, she's here, she's fine. This bitch is drained. Like, straight up, no color in her face. He sleeps for two whole ass days. Later, after we get home and stuff, he men- mentions that she might see him again, but she wasn't really sure that she liked it because he kept biting her. And then she slept for two days. Bro, that was a fucking vampire, and you can't convince me otherwise. You just can't. You just can't. What happens in the past from Bracol 10280? Please be warned. This experience is very graphic, and some listeners may find it disturbing or even triggering. This story that I'm about to tell today, even though it happened years ago, still gives me chills, and I feel like it has a lot to do with why I quit my job. So I used to work in long-term care of pretty much a nursing home. I was a certified nursing assistant out of high school. This was my first big girl job, okay? So when I first started, I didn't know a lot about the different types of shifts, but there was pretty much 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7. I worked the 7 to 3, which was 7 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
as time went on, I slowly started to transition to 3 to 11 to work around my college courses. But every now and then I would pick up an 11 to 7 shift. It didn't take long before I started working there where people were telling me about this one particular resident that had an issue with people of a certain color coming into his room. I didn't have too much interaction with this resident because, like I said, I only work seven to three and you didn't have to do a lot for him. Just go in and check on him and make sure he was okay. Bring him his food tray. Every now and then he might ask you for help to go to the bathroom, but that was about it. I have heard that this resident could get kind of nasty sometimes. I also heard that he had dementia, so he was seeing stuff. And I also remember going in his room a couple times and seeing all of the mirrors in his room covered up. This is going to come back later. So on my first 11 to 7, we'll call this nurse Patty. Patty pulled me aside and she was like, hey, this is the list of people pretty much doing a report for when I first clocked in, starting my shift. She told me who I had, who was total assist, which I had to do everything for, and who I could pretty much, you know, let. So I noticed that this list had this certain patient's number on it, this certain resident's number on it. His room number was on there. But instead of it saying, you know, just limited assistance or whatever, it was like total assist. So I asked, I'm like, I know I have him during the day and I just go in and check on him and make sure he's okay. If he rings the call, like, I'll go in. But other than that, that's about it. When did he become a total assist? So she proceeds to tell me that the night before, he got so scared and so frantic and thought something was in his room that he jumped out of his bed and fell on the floor and did something to his hip. So at this point, currently, he's a total assist, meaning I have to go in, I have to check on him, I have to do everything for him. I said, cool, no problem. I start doing my rounds, I start checking on my people, passing out ice water, changing people, as I normally do. Literally, not even 15 minutes into my shift, his call light is on. I go in, I make sure everything's okay. As soon as I get in, I kid you not, this man is literally in the fetal position. I walk up to him and I ask him if everything's okay. Obviously, when I walk up to him, I'm very careful because like I stated before, he did not like people of my color coming into his room. During the day, he would make a big deal out of this. If he could get a nurse or a nursing assistant of a different color, he definitely would. He did not pay that any mind. He literally jumped straight into, they're in here, they're after me, please help me. I'm looking like, who is they? He's like, you don't see that little boy behind you? No, I can't say that I do, sir. So it took me literally 15 minutes, and by the grace of God, I was able to calm this man down. We're going to call him Mr. Johnson. After I calmed Mr. Johnson down, I left out of the room, and I went and did my rounds like usual. Literally, not even 10 minutes later, he's back on the call light. I said, okay, maybe he's got to go to the bathroom or something. I don't know. So I went in, checked. This time when I went in the room, I noticed that the room was extremely cold, extremely cold. When I went in there, Earlier, it was not cold like that. Now, that nursing home in particular was a little colder on a graveyard shift. But when I tell you it was cold to the point where I could see my breath cold. At this point, not only is he in the fetal position, but he is also under the covers and he is also crying. So I walk up to him. I lift the cover up. I look under the cover. Again, he's sitting under there. We make immediate eye contact and he's help me. Please help me. So I'm trying to calm him down because whatever he's seeing, I'm just not seeing it. So I'm like, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to need for you to cooperate with me. I'm going to need for you to tell me what's going on so I can better assist you and we can get through this shift together. At this point, I'm doing what I've been taught to do for somebody who's going through a dementia or Alzheimer's crisis, which is what I was told that he had. He calms down a little bit and he literally just starts talking. And when I tell you this got crazy quick. It got crazy quick. So he's telling me that when he was younger, about his 20s or 30s, he was married to a young woman. We're going to call her Maggie. Him and Maggie had just bought a farm. It was literally just him and Maggie. And before you knew it, Maggie got pregnant. Back then, it literally wasn't uncommon to have people of color hired as help to help you on the farm, to help you raise kids, whatever the case may be. This was post-slavery, but people was very much still feeling entitled to doing whatever they wanted to do to people of color. So that's the time frame we had. He tells me that months go down the line, whatever. He goes and he wakes up early one morning. He sees that his wife is a little uncomfortable. She tells him, like, maybe the baby's coming or whatever. He doesn't think nothing of it. He goes out, get on his tractor, and he does his farm at work. He has a farm hand named Tommy. Tommy is a black man, okay? Around lunch, he's guessing, is when his wife went into labor while he was still out in the field. His wife called her mother-in-law, which was Mr. Johnson's mom, Her sister-in-law and his brothers came as well. Everybody's making sure that everything's going okay. The baby is finally born at some point. When the baby is born, I guess everybody in the room looked around at each other and realized that this baby was not in no way, shape, or form white. 
The brothers immediately take the baby and they go outside. His mom sits there with her and they go. They snatch this baby and they take the baby outside. Meanwhile, all this is going on. Him and Tommy are still out in the field. They took this baby out into a body of water. And I will not be saying what they did to this baby, but you can only imagine for the time period. Him and Tommy finally wrap up their work for the day and he heads back to the house. When he gets inside the house, he sees his wife sitting there with his mother. His wife is crying. His mom's just sitting there irritated and pissed off. He asks what's going on, and that's when she gives him the whole rundown that your wife was pretty much sleeping with your field in, and this is the situation that you're in. So he asks, where is the baby? And the mom says, your brother's taking care of it. Don't worry about it. You need to figure out what you're going to do with her. Meanwhile, this is going on. His brothers have went and got Tommy out of the field. The things that they did to Tommy, again, I cannot describe it here on TikTok, but just imagine the torture and everything that he went through. They literally just left him there in that field. They left him there in the middle of the field. This man proceeds to tell me that when he finally figures out what happened and what his brothers did, they literally acted like nothing ever happened. And every night, Tommy and his son will come and visit him like clockwork. At this point, when I tell you the chills are running up my spine, Literally every hair on my body is sticking up. I don't know what to say. I'm like, when they, when they say frozen in fear, I was frozen in fear. Because it's like, as soon as he told me that story, I could pick up on what was in the room. Before, I, I couldn't pick up on what it was, but I could immediately feel something else in the room with us. After he told me the story, I finally got him to calm down and he went to sleep. He slept for literally a couple hours and at this point, we're at three o'clock in the morning. Like clockwork, he hits that call light again, I go back in. I remember walking into the room and all of the sheets were taken off of the mirrors, which I thought was very strange because he wanted his mirrors covered up for a reason. I went over to Mr. Johnson and I touched him to make sure that he was okay. And this man was ice cold. He had died. As I went to leave the room to go contact a nurse, oh my God, I'm getting chills. I'm literally passing by this mirror. And as I'm headed out, on my left is the mirror. I turn and look in the mirror, and behind me, to the far wall of Mr. Johnson's room, I see a taller figure, and I see a shorter figure standing beside this taller figure that I would say is probably about the height of a five-year-old child. I have never seen nothing like that in my life, ever. And I cannot explain the amount of fear that ran through my body, but I got out of that room so quick, I will tell you that. The crazy part is that when the nurse came in, we could not understand how these mirrors got uncovered. Even the one in the bathroom was uncovered. The one in his room was uncovered. Again, this is a man that just hurt his hip yesterday. There's no reason why he should have been out of bed taking these blankets off this mirror, and I know he wouldn't have done it anyway. Also, the fact that she felt like he had been dead for longer than I said he had. But again, I had just talked to Mr. Johnson. I had literally just talked to him. So I don't understand how a dead man talks, but maybe y'all can let me know. And when I tell you, baby, I only lasted three more days after that. I didn't sleep for days. I said, I'm not coming back. Come And that's where we'll end today's episode of our two-part Halloween special. A huge thanks to the TikTokers who shared their spine-chilling stories with us. Your courage in recounting these moments adds so much to the seasonal shadows and mystery. Be sure to join us tomorrow for even more true ghostly experiences encountered by people just like you. I'll leave you with a final thought from a mystery man who knows a thing or two about the unknown. Happy Halloween. Do try not to die. Until tomorrow, stay safe and don't look over your shoulder too often. This is Marianne bidding you farewell from the Shadowlands. Thanks for listening to this episode. Ka kite.